continue. I'm, I'm just listening. Okay. So I'm trying to, I'm just bringing us up to where we were before that he's, he's, he's rejecting dualism. You don't try to block out our interface with the world. That's a lie about our minds. Our minds are connected to the outside world. But he's also rejecting reductionism. Our minds are not a blank slate. We are not simply the product of all of that feed in from the outside world. Our neural maps evolved over time, the basic evolutionary processes, digestion, circulation, nutrition. But then there's the more recent ones because our brains are big and we're always creating these neural maps. And so we have this interface with the outside world, but those reactions turn into feelings and then we can reflect on our feelings and then our thoughts can cause our thoughts and we can start to get a grip and we can integrate our feelings and our thoughts and our way of life. So the goal is homeostasis, that there is this balance and this um, inner peace, right? You've got all the systems are go, all the systems are working together. And he says that if you want all these systems to work together, your interface with the world has to include, first of all, the golden rule. You have to treat other people the way you want to be treated. Or you're going to be maladaptive. You're not going to survive. Like he said, over time, the creatures or the human beings who learned how to get along, to cooperate, survived. And the ones that didn't died out. Um, our brains are wired to cooperate. So when you read religious texts and um, Jesus tells you to follow the golden rule or Confucius tells you that or Buddha tells you stuff, it's not true because they said so. And it's not a religion, you know, some supernatural transcendent out of this world. He's saying, no, no. <laughs> That is natural. So there's no gap at all between the standard religious doctrines of how to live and the actual evolutionary, what was, what led to flourishing, what makes us fit, our survival and our fitness. Now, as the human Okay, salvation, all right. As societies become more and more complex, our neural mapping gets more and more complex. And at a certain point in evolution, it became so complex that we became self-consciously aware that we actually are deliberating. We're aware that we can predict behavior, uh, threats or positive or negative things, but we also start to work together and we become aware that you were working together and we develop patterns and we develop language and so, and we develop these thoughts. And so then our thoughts start to affect our neural mapping, our emotions. And then we have to figure out, well, what thoughts should we have? And so there's two kinds of, um, I mean, so human salvation, what was considered supernatural in the past, is actually the way we should live to have homeostasis. So um, loving others and loving yourself are the same. And then you want to seek joy. That's how you get joy. Um, and sorrow comes from worrying about how other people react to you, pride, greed, all this stuff causes sorrow because it's a lie about your life. It's maladaptive and it creates neural maps that put you 
that destroy homeostasis homeostasis within yourself you're never rich enough you're never powerful enough so your dis uh your neural mapping doesn't achieve balance internally plus you're creating animosity with other people and so you're maladaptive in any kind of social context and we are social and political we need to get along we're not a blank slate and we can't create our own world we need to get along so um we want to understand now this is where i disagree with them and i don't see how it follows at all because in our desire to understand the world we should understand that our time on earth is limited right we die but um and a lots of religious obviously religious doctrines try to help people cope with death and some of them make up stories or try to get people to believe that they don't really die other ones just um one from africa was that god put people brought people together at the beginning and he had a, he gave people a choice either you can live forever or you can have grandchildren right okay and the people chose grandchildren it was a way for people to realize that they should not want to live forever because they're grandchildren you know it's just natural cycle of life so i do not know mr damasio it doesn't follow from what he said spinoza would not agree with this at all but it justifies what he does. <laughs> he creates these drugs that are trying to fight against death and suffering. And so <laughs> I, I think it's a self-interest. He doesn't understand that, you know, if you really did follow this, you wouldn't put as much faith in opioids and um, what he's dedicated his life to as he does. But anyway. So how do you train your mind? Um, you, uh, he affirms life and turns emotions and then feelings into the means for nourishing a person and you unite body and mind. Um, you systematically map the mind. And he's, he has this, he calls it mental immunologist, all right? So Spinoza, goes through this whole list of emotions and he defines an emotion um, like uh, greed and he defines it in a way that is trying to convince you you don't want to be that because it will destroy your joy and it will make you unhappy and so before you are tempted to be greedy or before you're tempted to do that you're immunized against it so that you won't be tempted or you know it tries to cure you after you've got the disease but it's just a kind of therapy right and it's a kind of um vaccine <laughs> it vaccinates you to prevent you from getting this sickness uh or it's a drug after you've gotten it to sort of cure your sick soul um Okay, so he's bringing back religion because he's been trained in this science that religion is just anti-science. And he says, no, that's not true. Um, that science can be used to improve the human condition, but it can be linked to humanism and it can be linked to a deeply felt religious faith, right? Because religious faith is this insulation against sorrow religious faith what the religions teach is exactly what spinoza is teaching not to be greedy not to you know worry about what other people think um take the log out of your own eye just clear up your own soul and that's and then you will be joyful so uh judge not that you not be judged take the log you know uh deal with your own problems rather than worrying about other people's problems 
uh, worrying about trying to live their life for them. Anyway, so um, so he says we we should combine science with the best of a humanist tradition. And of course, that's what my book does is that I think the Greeks have a really good model of spiritual humanism that's a lot that's better than Spinoza had. Okay. So the, the natural life of the spirit, kindness and generosity toward others, experiences of beauty, uh, actions motivated by love, well-balanced, well-tempered, well-intentioned. Okay, this should sound familiar, um, except that in the Greeks, you can't just have good intentions. You have to also be wise. And I think Mr. Damasio has good intentions, but he makes some real mistakes. Oh, Warren, what would you like? Did you have your hand up, Warren? No, it was from earlier when I just came into class because I came late. I didn't want to disturb you to tell you to record. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the spiritual life is actually a state of the organism, all right? And it's driven by your ideas. You get the right ideas, you get the right kind of spirit, you get the right kind of emotions, and you can produce homeostasis. Um, then, and okay, so this, up to here, it's you have to change your ideas to control your homeostasis. Well, then he starts talking about drugs. <laughs> and you remember Mr. Van der Kolk said, we were just getting toward, you know, the arts and culture and all that as dealing with trauma. And then the druggies came along, you know, there was some profit motive and it all fell apart and got replaced with drugs. Well, Mr. Damasio is just working out, you know, cooperation, organizing a society. Remember in theater, the kids have to cooperate. They have to trust each other in the arts. There's this joyful living. I mean, it, they're right on the same plane, except that Mr. Vonderkoek would say, wait a sec, like, how'd you bring in drugs? Okay, so he thinks that the neurobiology will lead to effective treatments for pain, depression, uh, aggression, uh, violence, and um, what was it? There's one other thing. Anyway, all right, but drugs alone, you just said that drugs alone don't do it. Actually, that drugs aren't even the primary cause. It's your thoughts. Um, and then he says, we should he even knows that he says, actually, previously, we have had these efforts at social engineering, and they have failed. But this time, it's going to work. Because this time, we really know how the brain works. Uh, we have to believe we can make a difference. We can cure everyone from drug addiction, violence, pain, and depression. All right. What do you think of that? Didn't he just, isn't this contradicting himself? He just said, you have to change your mind. And all of a sudden, hey, but these drugs are gonna cure everything. Anybody bothered by that? Yeah, I actually thought about that so many. <laughs> it was, <coughs> I'm sorry. It's almost like he thinks there's a mental chemical change that will stop people completely from having depressed feelings or being susceptible to addiction and like like he can prevent it from happening with drugs changing making it to where that neural map never exists which i don't think that that's yeah i have a problem with it because i don't think that's possible well, not only that, he just said that those more recent neural maps are driven yeah. by your thoughts, right? <coughs> he himself yeah. said that, the golden rule. I mean, can you take a pill and all of a sudden the golden rule will come to your mind and nothing else? <laughs> and he doesn't talk about putting people in different environments and changing their relationships with people 
he doesn't even say that. He doesn't say these drugs have to be in coordination with um, a change in environment, giving people a job, you know, giving them a new community to relate to, a new social identity where they're not the loser or some. Does everybody understand that? He does, he says. <laughs> thoughts cause thoughts and we are social and political and then he says oh but these drugs are going to solve everything okay alicia did you notice that yeah i noticed that i mean and i think we touched on this at the end of i don't know friday when everybody had left because i had read a little bit further and because you can't cure those things but I think maybe, but he doesn't say it, but maybe he's talking about the symptoms of like, when you go into palliative care or like end of life care, just to keep people comfortable. Okay, we can treat the symptoms of depression so that you don't feel depressed, which you can, but you're not eradicating depression. The person still has depression. So maybe if he's thinking about getting rid of the symptoms so that the person doesn't struggle with depression, I could I, I could kind of follow that line. Well, if he's talking about neural mapping, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe the drug will change your body chemistry and your thoughts. They've gotten into a rut, right? So it can change that or it gives you a, a door, an opportunity. But you have to then go change your environment, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to create a new neural map, because these obsessions are not as powerful, that's, I mean, you do have to be completely active if you're going to actually build a new neural mapping structure. Mm -hmm. The drug doesn't do that, right? The drug might open the door to get you so you don't have these repetitive thoughts. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to create a new map for you. Does no, you still have to do the work. How could he, he doesn't even say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that is so bizarre. OK, <laughs> Ivy, what did you do? Are you wait, I'll ask Warren first and then I'll ask you. OK, Warren, are you following what I'm saying? Yes, I'm following what you're saying. Did um, it you when you read it what I, what I think happened is that and i think it happened to even myself as well when you when you are talking about something and you find a path if you keep going on and on about it if you're not careful you're going to be you're going to end up like it's either you say the same thing over or you contradict yourself and i think that is what is happening with most of these philosophers they have um found what they want to say but to try to quote unquote develop their thoughts at that point they keep going over and over it to the point where they start contradicting themselves and then and that's right that's true of um, everybody we've read right yeah they keep go they they find something solid and it's almost as if like they want to find a way not to say play devil's advocate but like keep going over to better what they said, and then they end up tearing the entire building down. Yeah, they, they let's put it in Damasio's language. They developed a neural map. Yes. That gives them homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. It just happens that I'm the savior of the world. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but then they cannot handle further complexity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because their neural mapping is making them comfortable. <laughs> and, and so, but the more it's comfortable, the more they're shutting themselves off from the outside world and the more dysfunctional they get. Does that make sense? Yes. And that, yeah, that's why I like teaching it because each time you teach it, you can see that this person was blind each one of them was blind to the way their theory could be abused, right? Yeah. We, we started that from the beginning, 
but then they're also blind to what other possibilities there are, right? And so actually Mr. Damasio is able to call out a whole lot of other people who were blind, right? The dualists yeah. are wrong, the blank slaters are wrong, the religion people who think religion is anti-science are wrong, the science people who are so obsessed that they're anti-religion, they're wrong, right? So I have a more complex view, like you said, Warren, when you came last time. Yeah, this is better, right? But then he goes and he, oh my God, right? So the other thing about it, you have to look at the context. It's so dramatic because this book was published in 2003, which means it was written before that. I guarantee you it takes a while to get something published. So... It occurred before the opiate crisis, right? Have opiates saved us from depression, violence, pain, and, and has ha, have opiates been our salvation? No. No. Nope. Hundreds of thousands of people die from overdoses every year. What is 150,000 or something? I mean, it's, it's not in the news, but it is outrageous, right? I mean, so then you go, Mr. Damasio, see, the thing is, I got annoyed because I'm not going to feel sorry for this guy for overlooking this. Like, I think he's intellectually irresponsible. I think he should have known that he's not going to save the world with just drugs. And when you think that, you don't think about things like, these drugs are powerful. So the people who made them need to get on advisory boards and tell corporations to, you know, don't sell them to anybody, make sure the people are licensed, make sure they don't give big doses. And then they've got to get on the talking to legislators you must make laws to do this. You must, right? The guy's yeah. developing them. And then when he thinks it's going to save the world, none of them hold out any red flags. And that's exactly what happened, right? It got driven by the profit motive. And it got driven by corporations, paid politicians to make laws or not make laws because of their profits, the Sackler family, right? And Mr. Damasio, I hold him accountable for that because he knows how powerful they are and he should have known, right? He's blind, he's blind. Do you understand he has the blindness of Apollo? Like Apollo kept giving human beings these wonderful new toys, <laughs> like nuclear weapons were gonna solve us from ever having war again. <laughs> Did that work? But that was, Definitely the, not. that was the idea, right? We'll never have war again, isn't that great? But I mean, these Apollonian guys with their reason, you know, and their science and their technology, they just think they're going to save the world and they give it to humanity and it all blows up. And they don't take responsibility, which drives me bananas because they should anticipate this stuff. And they should be on the forefront of talking about, you got to regulate this stuff. Um, okay. Ivy, does that make sense to you? Does it make sense to you? Does everybody on board with this line of reasoning? Yes. It, it was, I mean, it's, you could, can you imagine how I'm pulling my hair out <laughs> on the airplane? Ah, what is this? Um, but anyway, I don't know if I screeched in the middle of an airplane, but okay, so we're going to read Paul Davies uh, coming up next week. Um, I can put the chapter on Davies and Damasio in, in there, but you don't have to read it. You just have to read Davies. It's just that maybe you can do for yourself. You can figure out how it links. Um, and then Laszlo, those are the two we're reading next time. 
So my point is that it all just fits together. Um, one, of, one of them is a systems thinker. One of them is a quantum physicist. Um, okay. And they both have views of the soul. So, and uh, anyway, they, and they both think ideas cause ideas. That's the thing that's so amazing. Um, the, the computer guy talks about the difference between the software and the hardware, which with social media and all the stuff going on, you know, QAnon can use that, that science-based, technology-based stuff to create all these crazy views of reality, right? When the people originally created it, ah, everybody's going to be totally informed from now on. <laughs> Wait a sec. Because the reason, because thoughts cause thoughts. And we literally create all these neural networks that we fall in love with that drive our behavior. And they, and so science can be a tool for evil or good. You know, it's just a tool and it's a powerful tool. Um, anyway, so Damasio and the Greeks, this is what I was getting at that um, I'm applying Greek culture and uh, Aristotle's view of a, of a flourishing life. And um, let me see where I, yeah, all these virtues. Aristotle understood this, and he was a biologist. So I, I would hope that Damasio would agree with me on this. He, uh, Damasio himself says he prefers Aristotle to Spinoza because Spinoza was too disengaged with life, and Aristotle wanted a flourishing life, you to be engaged with life. I completely agree with that. And then all these virtues, we went through that. You can take, you know, what we, you remember from what we studied in Aristotle, and you can apply it to his view of homeostasis and see, well, yes, yeah, similarity and difference. Um, but uh, let's see, let me go through the, the deities is what I want to do is, um, okay, this is what I'm going to go through, okay? So I have a chapter. Um, did you read the chapter on this where I applied the Greek deities to talking to um, Damasio about what, what he missed out, what he didn't notice? Did anybody read it or should I just talk about it? All right. So um, I, really, I really had fun with this in terms of creativity. But, all right, so with Demeter and Poseidon, you think about when Damasio and the people working on opioids, when they come up, when they tell everybody, we're going to save the world, this is great. And all this funding goes to neuroscience. Mark Zuckerberg gave a huge pile of money to neuroscience. And the Obama administration supported the National Science, let's see, uh, Foundation Research in Neuroscience. All this stuff is really trendy. And um, so uh, my claim is that when you over hype, hype the stuff and you're not accounting for these other things, you're all the funding that should have gone into sustainability of the earth, right? I mean, people are not going to be mentally stable when we start having climate catastrophes. <laughs> you know, I mean, like you can't have homeostasis in a vacuum. So the money went into neuroscience instead of going into problems with Poseidon is the god of the sea. So these two basically represent sustainability, the fertility of the earth, human fertility, which is down 40% because this, there's sperm. I mean, it's crazy what we're doing. And we know that plastic and this crap that we're surrounded with is affects our reproductive system. We got all the data. 
and we're just ignoring it and we're giving money to opioid producers and then Poseidon is the hurricanes and um, obviously we've got all that kind of disruption too the tornadoes the hurricanes all that stuff so the so that's one thing is that funding went into this with this blind faith that it's going to save us instead of going into sustainability the next thing the Zeus and Athena is that those people like Damasio who knew the chemistry behind it should have gone to the legislatures and said, you must regulate this severely, right? There's gotta be strict regulation that, and you must not let the corporations pay for political campaigns and then tell you to do otherwise. These guys should have been calling it out anticipating it um and then you have to have which therapist which psychiatrist the training of psychiatrists the training of counselors all has to include what opioids can and can't do and how easily addictive they are and how it should be a low potion portion i mean i just want you to think about how many things should have been brought up and they were not <laughs> when, you, when you mentioned that i'm sure that you know i don't remember the family's name but sackler okay they told everybody that it's not addictive i know and they made three billion bucks and their lawyers have not i mean they sent their money to switzerland i mean that story is huge that's pfizer yeah. Who, who agree? I mean, who would just readily accept that it's not addictive without looking into it? Well, if you but know the not... chemistry behind it, I mean, what is its whole purpose? Is the dopamine and the serotonin and that stuff is anyway? Yes. So many people just. But I mean, the thing that annoys me is that Damasio and his crowd said nothing. Okay, like that's. If you have the Apollonian power to create this stuff, you really need to also have a, the, the fortitude or foresight to know you've got to work with the legal system. Anyway, then there's Hera, honor, right? We honor people who made these drugs, right? We, we gave them glory. Mr. Damasio was just fame, famous, three Nobel Prize winners, praised his book you know and so that's where we give our honor and i think it's misplaced right okay apollo then there's artemis artemis would be the type of person who would refuse to take the stuff because it's unnatural so some people who really need it aren't gonna aren't gonna take it so what are you gonna do mr demaz are you gonna force them to take it are you gonna force them are going to say i won't hire you unless you take it i mean how much force are you going to use for somebody who doesn't believe in it <laughs> then you have aphrodite and dionysus oh with aries aries is the god of war violence and these drugs are going to be save us from violence well who gets to diagnose somebody who's too violent who absolutely has to take this opioid. Like, what if they don't wanna take it? Are they not gonna be allowed to get a job? How are they gonna be manipulated into taking it? On the other hand, if they take it and they, they get just completely zonked out, like maybe they had a healthy aggression, it was just their personality. Are they gonna to get totally zonked out by this stuff? So nobody's allowed to have an assertive personality. Um, what about, you know, who gets to diagnose somebody that's pathologically violent, you know, that needs a pill, right? Mm -hmm. You can say you committed a crime, you go to prison or something, but that to me, the idea that a pill would cure people of violence without looking at the cultural context both of who gets to define who's violent, which behavior is violent, and who, well, how do you- It's all frozen up. Oh, okay, there you are. <laughs> and my connection was, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Well, anyway, do you understand? Can you follow what I'm saying? You might have some experience in this. Um, it just makes somebody into God, you know, and gets to decide, you know, I'm going to cure everybody of violence. So you take this pill and you, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. And then there's Hades and Persephone, like that's the legacy. What sort of legacy? Mr. Damasio thought the legacy was that he's going to be this great hero because he was part of making these drugs. Now the legacy of these drugs is horrible, right? I mean, the story about these drugs is going to be all about weren't regulated, blind spot, um, and all these addictions and all these huge amount of problems. They did not cure us of pain, <laughs> violence, depression. Who on earth thought that a pill would cure people of that? When depression, you've got to put people in a different social situation. Um, and then Hestia is the one like me who stands back and goes, wait a sec. <laughs> Uh, Hestia is the one that would call it out because she would know, wait, you're not acknowledging these other gods. You're not acknowledging. Oh, yeah, the Aphrodite one was what if somebody likes the feeling, obviously, of opioids? And what if their only connection with other people was under the influence of an opioid, right? Like those are the friendships they have, is when they get together and take an opioid. So, and what are you gonna do about that? Then the next thing with Aphrodite is that immediate pleasure gratification is a huge problem, but the corporations tap into that. And so they want, you know, how is Aphrodite gonna influence? The corporations will pay politicians to allow this to be like over the counter. It's just recreational. Why not? Who says? You know, get those politicians out of my life. I want to have this as a recreational drug. Who's who's to tell me it can't be, right? And the corporations will control. And so instead of having it regulated, it's gonna, it you could anticipate this exactly the situation that we have. And so I'm saying Mr. Damasio, on the one hand, he's a tragic character. He's blind. He's obsessed with Apollo and, um, and Apollo's great gift to humanity. And on the other hand, um, I, I, I think he's responsible for his ignorance. I don't think everybody, there's any sort of obligation to be that ignorant. Um, Okay, so final comments. Uh, Warren, you have to go. Do you have any final comments? Uh, not at the moment, but I had. I was going to hang back a little to ask you a question after class, after everyone leaves. Okay, how late were you? I didn't keep track. Go again? How late were you to class today? 10 minutes? Probably like, you're probably like 10. You're probably like 10 or a little over 10. Okay. Just, um, yeah. Do you have any final comment, Alicia? Because you have you had some personal experience with some of all these, all this crap going on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. I agree with you. I don't think that there's anyone who's being honest with themselves. Anybody who has done as much studying <laughs> as people in Demasio's position have done, there's not any way that they could honestly claimed that they didn't know or that this wasn't going to happen they know the chemistry right they know yeah. the dopamine serotonin whatever yeah yeah i mean has that occurred to you before who are the people who develop these things yeah i don't that hadn't actually occurred to me before when I had thought about when I had talked about situations like this before, I had always just thought about the capitalism behind it, you know, people wanting that money. But I hadn't actually thought about, you know, accountability accountability and you know, people who had a good intention 
like I, I didn't see anybody with a good intention in in studying this stuff before. So well, I, um, I don't know. I still I still think that he was a little bit a victim of his times because before the opioid crisis, we were dealing with you know withdrawing everybody from the asylums and institutionalized care and if you continue just to use reason and separate everything from faith then it stands to reason that the remedy is completely biological when that's not true but he said he believes and then he says that there's no room for anything but a biological fix no, but i mean first he says no faith like yeah. institutional religion does have a function and it's a community and they support each other and they develop homeostasis. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and says the drug will do it. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing he says, he doesn't at all acknowledge that, that every, when people are seeking homeostasis, that's exactly the reason they go to war. Mm -hmm. because they say it's this other guy that's preventing us from our homeostasis and so as soon as we kill them off we will have homeostasis does right. that make sense? i mean it well, is so yeah. naive. it's just so naive i cannot i was just shocked did you really say that buddy yeah. right? and he says we're going to get over tribalism and racism and it doesn't occur to him that institutional religions if they are tribal, you know, I yeah. mean, people join them to get homeostasis and they're usually tribal and racist and he doesn't even, ah, drives me nuts. Does that make sense, Alicia? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I just sit there talking to myself and I don't know if I communicate with other people, but- no, I get it. <laughs> Was, yeah, to me it was jaw dropping yeah. about how over specialized. I mean, he's the one who's saying we need a new kind of humanistic kind of thinking that integrates science and all this stuff. And then he goes and says something that doesn't integrate anything. <laughs> well, no, it's like we need this, but oh well, let's just keep doing what we're doing. No, but he doesn't even think. He is, right? He really thinks he's totally open-minded. Mm. <laughs> okay, Ivy, what about you? Um, for my last comments, I was just gonna say when uh, I see where drugs have became like back when they uh, first hit the market and everything, they were powerful, but I feel like they've been modified to become even more powerful. So now they're like really addictive and people are uh, in this, what is it? Dead like mind state, homostasis, if you will. Um, and I feel like that plays a lot into what is going on nowadays and how uh, people aren't getting as much into politics or as much into things that we should, if that makes sense. Um, Cause they're all like distracted or yeah, on drugs and they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. So like having this knowing that it was a problem back then and it wasn't fixed and it's just gone progressively worse to where now we're, you know, no one is really like, hey, drugs aren't you know drugs are causing this big wave everyone i mean well not everyone but it's you're pretty much uh, i can't even it's a serious social problem let's put yeah it, <laughs> right and yeah and we're not thinking about it correctly so our neural maps are just <laughs> okay. okay yeah when he was um saying that we have to keep remapping our neural maps for that i was thinking that you know holds a lot of truth because if you if you have if you've never interacted with society and the few humans that you know you do interact with they only give you bad results and so you get the you get this 
um, thing in your head that all humans are bad. But if you think that way, you might never gain more knowledge, if that makes sense. You'll just be stuck off on your own having to figure everything out for yourself rather than discovering what else there is, if that makes sense. Not only that, if you think people aren't trustworthy, mm -hmm. you're not going to trust people. Right? You're not going to trust and anything. You're, you're going to... and. You're gonna end you might up not notice it, but you will gain small trust issues in almost everything. Well, you tend to, you know, create the world mm -hmm. <laughs> the way. I mean, that's why the. I mean, what I would grant the drugs is they give people a, an opportunity to rewire, but it's the mm -hmm. rewiring that's important, and you can't do that unless you get in a different environment with different people. So like Mr. Van der Kolk said, the having the theater, right? His son, I guess, started, got involved in theater and you have to relate to people and you have to play act somebody else and you have to, you know, that's, that's what Mr. DeVanco doesn't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and yet we honor them, right? We honor the... And Mr. Zuckerberg gives a pile of money to neuroscience as if it's going to save us. So I was even at a conference just to, the first time I ever heard about this stuff, I was at this conference and I was, these smart people, a couple of them, they were, it was like God, neuroscience. They were looking to it to solve human problems. And it was kind of scary because I didn't, I don't know. I mean, there are, it's just a different version of what I would think of as blind faith. But this one guy, particularly ironically, he was going through a divorce and he, he was here at this conference. He was going to be gone for two weeks. He's ditching his kids <laughs> so that he could go and, you know, get high on neuroscience, you know. If you're going through a divorce, you should be with your kids. You should be working through it with your kids, right? Does that make sense, you guys? Mm -hmm. You don't run to neuroscience and cut off your relationships with your children. Uh, anyway. <laughs> But, it, but again, it's the same theme. It goes back to that enlightenment faith. So he actually is one of those enlightenment thinkers who thinks science will change the world. Uh, except that, you know, religion isn't so bad as long as you keep your priorities straight. <laughs> but, okay, so Alicia and Ivy, I have to tell you, what would somebody think if I said, you know, every scientist in the US must get an education in the 12 Olympian deities, <laughs> right? People are gonna go, what kind of a- How, how is that relevant? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would just be a shocker, right? I mean, you would even understand if somebody said they have to be Christian or they have to whatever, but mm -hmm. Greek myth, like, cut me some slack. You mean those Zeus that chased around nymphs and got him pregnant and Hera? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they take it literally. Like, mm -hmm. it's really about, it's, what, it's about breaking your neural map, right? When you have a story of Zeus chasing around nymphs and his wife gets jealous and goes after them and the women are psychologically harmed, the kids are psychologically harmed. It's not affirming that. It's just telling it, that's what could happen. And it's appealing to the neural maps, right? Mm -hmm. It's resonating, okay? So yeah, I um, always talk about how fiction stories, we think those are just made up stories, but you don't, think that those are how it you know it all comes from something those are stories that we're telling in order to like tell the different possibilities as that makes sense like uh, 
there's plenty, plenty, plenty of stories over love and heartbreak and, you know, the whole trial thing. But like the more uh, movies over it that you watch, the more different situations and possibilities you become aware of. Does that make sense? Well, the problem is the stories of love, erotic poetry, that was one of mm -hmm. the you can have the really good ones that will actually teach you not to be sentimental and not to be blind, right? Mm -hmm. But there's just such a fine line between that. And if you're a good storyteller, you can just change a few things and all of a sudden it becomes entertainment and fantasy and it can corrupt people, right? It can get people to... Um, dissociate their own er erotic life and just project into a screen or the way people interpret the same story it can get it can get it can turn into uh miseducating people rather than educating people but i do think that the reason for the miss is so people are not naive right mm -hmm that they're honest yes i understand that desire to go ditch your family do all that harm you know go for the sweet young thing and and the the myth shows you how much harm that does mm -hmm. and it's trying to get you to flush that out actually just to, to you know dis disengage the neural map and create a better map that's what it's there for um but, but it's, that wasn't how it was read, you know, Plato talks about how they started reading it literally and using it to justify their terrible behavior, which is how the Bible gets used these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. Any final comments on this? Everybody sort of get the gist. Yeah. I, I get it. Okay. And then you can see where next week, um, hopefully you, when you read the stuff, you'll go, yeah. oh yeah, this is connected to blah, blah. It's also, again, a rejection of the enlightenment dualism and um, whatever. So Damasi, Van der Kolk said, we kept getting into this alternative ancient yoga, blah, blah stuff. And then the Apollonians and the corporations came in there with their solution, right? Mr. Damasio is a classic case of one of those guys that does that, that Mr. Van der Kolk would be very annoyed with. <laughs> but he, he rejects the enlightenment, then he can't help himself, brings it back. Okay, so the next ones are all, again, a rejection of dualism, a rejection of reductionism um, in favor of thinking in terms of the systems, the biosphere, the ecosphere, everything is connected to everything, or with the computers, the hardware and the software. And nobody thought when, when the internet started, it was scientists were gonna be able to communicate with each other every person was going to be able to be informed, right? Because they'd have all the information they needed for everything. That is truly what people thought at first. And guess what? <laughs> right? It's just another example of the Apollonians giving humanity this shiny object. <laughs> Does everybody understand that, guys? Yeah. It's crazy, but I, you know, it does make teaching Greek culture rewarding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see you. <laughs> okay. Get well.